My talk will be on the three principles of abstract reference that derive from Frege. The most known one is perhaps the one that has to do with abstraction principles, but there is also one that concerns singular terms and whether they appear in straightforwardly true sentences and one that has to do with identity conditions. My remote is not working. Yeah, something is wrong. Sorry. Froze. Yes, nothing happens. Yeah, I can see that. And I can't escape either. Okay, it's working. Sorry, something froze. Yes, everything is fine. Okay. Anyway, abstractionists, by whom I will refer to the neo free guns such as Helen Wright, as well as, for example, Augustin Rayo or our own keynote, Oystein, employ abstraction principles in their view of reference. Again, something is wrong. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's never happened before. Well, it's okay. Maybe you can re-enter into the Zoom conference and start it again. Yes, if I can, because it doesn't seem like I can do anything here. I can't even escape. Oh. Um. Yeah, nothing is happening. Well, we will do something, but just give us some minutes. Yes, just give me a minute and I will try to figure it out. I honestly have no idea what's going on. Yeah. Can you hear me and see me? It's working. Yes. No. Yeah, it's working. Okay. So back to my slide, which seems to be working now. The employ abstraction principles in the view of reference that are standardly formalized, as you can see on the slide, the a common example of an abstraction that is standardly taken to be in a good standing is Hume's principle, by which the number of f is the same as the number of g, if and only if the f's and the g's are equinumerous. And they see those abstraction principles as um, fixing in the way that I will explain the objectual reference of the sigma uh, operator. Um, There's the term fixed by the sigma operator. So in case of Hume's principle of numerical terms. But this is not the only one um, principle of abstract reference that they um, employ. They are also concerned with whether a term functions as a singular term in suitable true sentences. So for example, they take you have a sentence such as two is a prime number, um, which strikes us as obviously straightforwardly true. And because of that, we are inclined to take the terms that it involves such as two to be referring. And then given those two principles, the one that has to do with abstraction principles and the one that has to do with singular terms in straightforwardly true sentences, a question arises as to what is the relation between them. Is the one that concerns singular terms in true sentences the fundamental one and abstraction principle is just one way of satisfying it? Or is it the other way around that um, even if there is a suitable true sentence that involves the term in question, we furthermore need an abstraction principle to ensure that the term refers. 
And my argument will support the latter. That is, it will emphasize the significance of abstraction. And I will argue that the significance is due to the relation of abstraction with identity criteria of the objects to be referred to. And thus with yet another principle of a fragment account of abstract reference, that is a principle that has to do with identity conditions um, of the object to be referred to. So my talk, the aim of my talk will be to uh, describe those three principles and explain the relations between them. And I will argue that reflection on them brings to light a discriminating potential that the fragment views have to offer between cases where reference is successful, such as numbers, and cases where it is not. And the example that I use of apparent reference that is in fact not successful is that of fictional names. So I will talk a little bit about fictional names and my interest in those names will be twofold. First, it's supposed to show by an example, the relations between those three principles of abstract reference. And second, it is supposed to provide a response to criticisms of the neo friganism or abstractionism more generally, by which they lead to a unacceptably rich ontologies. Criticisms like that were made by, for example, Divers and Miller, or Matty Eklund, um, and I'm going to show that um, we won't have such an unacceptably rich ontology because there are there is a way to exclude such names as, for example, fictional names. So I will start with describing the three principles. Then in the second uh, section, I will talk a little bit about the case of fictional names. And finally, in the last bit, I will talk a little bit about what this case of fictional names reveals about those three principles. There will be a certain dilemma uh, that, that this case shows. So first, the neo-frigas believe that only in a context of a sentence, the reference of a singular term is determined, or to use the slogan, truth is prior to reference. More technically, the idea is that a singular term refers, provided that there is a suitable true sentence in which this term occurs, where suitable means a sentence that is free of all epistemic, modal, quotational, and other forms of vocabulary, standardly recognized to compromise straightforward referential function, as Helen White put it. So to put it in other words, the idea is that some sentences strike us as obviously true and then the semantic explanation of the true value makes it compelling to take the singular terms that um, they involve to be referring terms. Call it a syntactic requirement for abstract reference, I will call it SR for short. An expression succeeds in referring if it functions as a singular term in a true sentence that is free of forms of vocabulary that compromise straightforward reference. So consider, for example, two is a prime number, to use the example that I just mentioned a minute ago. It is, normally we take those mathematical sentences, provide paradigm examples of those um, straightforwardly true sentences. So two is a prime number, struck as obviously straightforwardly true. It doesn't involve any kind of vocabulary that would uh, compromise its referential function. So because of that, we are inclined to take the singular term it involves, namely two, to be a referring term. However, just to so, show the contrast, consider the term Zeus in uh, Zeus is a god, or the Greeks believe that Zeus is a god. Even though Zeus functions as a singular term in both of those sentences, Neither of them is a clear cut case that um, uh, makes the term to meet uh, this requirement. In the first case, the case of a sentence used as a god is because this sentence is not obviously true. Most of us are not inclined to take Zeus as a god to be a true sentence. The Greeks believed that Zeus is a god, on the other hand, does strike us as true. However, it doesn't seem suitable in the relevant sense because of the, the phrase, the Greeks believe that, that is the phrase typical to belief reports, which it might be argued compromises the straightforward referential function. So the idea is that sentence is supposed to be both true and suitable. 
in the relevant sense, and only then we can infer the, the singular terms that involves our theory. And now the reference of singular terms is to objects as the neo emphasized, emphasize, which brings us to a requirement for abstract reference, which has to do with specifying identity conditions for these objects. And that is sometimes expressed for the famous no entity without identity. For Frege, the question of identity was crucial and it was his consideration of SR that brought him to it. In Grundlagen, he argues that since numerical expressions are names that succeed in referring to objects, then given any numerical expression A and any other name that refers B, the identity statement A equals B will be either true or false. This is how he puts it. If we are to use the symbol A to signify an object, we must have a criterion for deciding in all cases whether B is the same as A, even if it is not always in our power to apply this criterion. So here's the second principle, CI, I will call it for short. If a singular term alpha succeeds in referring any identity statement of the form alpha equals beta, where beta is also a singular term that succeeds in referring, has a determined true value and it is possible to establish a criterion that gives us truth conditions. So in other words, this principle requires a referring term to be associated with a statement that gives identity conditions for the object to be referred to. And now meeting this requirement is complex when it comes to objects to, as Tanwright put it, there is no presumption that we have any prior or independent means of reference, such as it may be argued abstract objects or to put it more broadly, objects other than actually existing concrete objects. And it is in the context of attempting to fulfill CI for numerical terms that Frege introduces HP. Here's a quote again. In our present case, we have to define the sense of the proposition, the number which belongs to the concept F is the same as that which belongs to the concept G. That is to say, we must represent the content of this proposition in other terms, avoiding the use of the expression, the number which belongs to the concept F. In doing this, we shall be given a general criterion of identity for numbers. When we have thus acquired the means of arriving at a determinate number and of recognizing it again as the same, we can assign it a number word as its proper name. Thus, Frege introduces Hume's principle and more generally abstraction principles because of the role they play in fulfilling CI. And here is the third and last principle of abstract reference. If singular terms of the forms the f of alpha and the f of beta succeed in referring, so that the identity statement of the form the f of alpha and the f of beta has a true value, then there will be a corresponding sentence of the form E alpha beta, where E is an equivalence relation that fixes the true conditions of that identity statement. So it basically requires a term to be associated with an appropriate abstraction principle. And to take stock, here are the three principles that I distinguished. SR that concerns singular terms and whether they appear in suitable true sentences, CI that requires a term to be associated with an identity statement for the object in question, and AP that requires it to be associated with an abstraction principle. And now I believe that an issue arises as to how to reconcile SR with AP, in particular, if there are cases in which SR appears to be met but for which we can find no appropriate abstraction principle. And this is the position we face in the case of reference to fictional objects. So I will begin with a distinction between inter internal and external uses of those names. Fictional characters can be considered from within the fiction and from outside of the fiction. I will call an internal perspective, consider a fictional character from within the fiction. Sherlock Holmes, for example, can be considered as the detective who 
who lives on Baker Street, works with Fordson and so on. But he can also be considered from an external perspective, for example, as a fictional character created by Doyle, whose creation was inspired by Paul's detective stories and etc. So this I will call the external perspective. And now because of this distinction, fictional names are sometimes said to play a dual semantic function, serving sometimes as the subject of one discourse and sometimes as the other. Consider, for example, two sentences with one and the same name, Raskolnikov is a fictional character, and Raskolnikov is a young man. The first of those sentences, Raskolnikov is a fictional character, um, reflects the external perspective. It only makes sense if we're thinking of Raskolnikov from outside of the fiction. So here the name Raskolnikov serves as the subject of the external discourse. B, however, Raskolnikov is a young man seems to only make sense if we think of it from within the fiction. So here the name Raskolnikov serves as the subject of the internal discourse. And now it seems that A is less controversially true than B because B um, will require some, some form of a paraphrase or a prefix like in the fiction F and what it actually expresses is something like B prime in the fiction of Dostoevsky Raskolnikov is a young man. And because of that, it doesn't seem to be suitable in the relevant sense. So basically, just as I said before that the sentence, the Greeks believe that Zeus is a god is not suitable in the relevant sense because of the vocabulary typical to belief reports, this sentence isn't suitable in the relevant sense either because of the presupposed prefix in the fiction F. In other words, it is when fictional characters are considered from outside of the fiction that sentences concerning them make a strong case for satisfying us are. For example, I said earlier, Raskolnikov is a fictional character. Here we can also say Holmes is a fictional character. Holmes was created by Doyle. Holmes is more famous than any real detective or Lolita appeared already in Nabokov's earlier novel. All of those sentences reflect the external perspective and they seem true and suitable in the relevant sense. So they make a strong case for satisfying the SR requirement. And it is this kind of discourse, the external one that is standardly taken to provide the main motivation for fictional realism, which is uh, represented by Thomason, and that's exactly the motivation that she uh, talks about. And so does Everett, even though he argues against fictional realism, but he also presents this motivation as a compelling uh, argument for fictional realism. So when considered from outside of the fiction, the external uses of uh, fictional names, make a strong case for satisfying AP and let's now consider question raised for such names by AP. Now, in order to explain the problem raised by it, I will first take a look of how identity conditions for fictional characters are normally characterized. So here's Thomason's account. If X and Y are fictional characters originating from the same work, then X equals Y, if and only if X and Y are ascribed the same properties in that work. In Everett's account, if X and Y are fictional characters originating from the same work, then it is true that X equals Y, if and only if, according to that fiction, X equals Y, and it is false that X equals Y, y if and only if, according to the fiction, X does not equal Y. <clears throat> so what is at stake here is an identity condition for fictional characters considered externally. As I just said, this is, um, the, those external uses are important here. So we are to specify when two characters considered externally are the same. And at the same time, and this is what I believe causes the problem, the conditions in those accounts that I just mentioned appeal to the internal perspective of the characters in question, be it in terms of what properties they are assigned in literary work as in Thomason's formulation, or simply by using the according to the fiction prefix 
as ever does. And now I believe that it is unclear why what is internal to the fiction should constrain what is external to it. If appealing to the prefix in the fiction F does not succeed in establishing that names from fiction succeed in referring in internal context, it will succeed in establishing that names from fiction succeed in referring in external context either. So for example, consider the sentence, Superman is Clark Kent. If when we say it, what we actually express is that according to the fiction, Superman is Clark Kent, then we have only provided a means for evaluating the sentence understood internally and have done so in a way that does not require the names Superman or Clark Kent to be referring. Whether Superman considered externally the fictional character or the fictional character Clark Kent considered externally are one and the same is a separate question. And um, it seems that what we need is an identity condition that does not rely on what's in the fiction. And now, will we may conclude that fictional names fail to meet a P because there isn't, there isn't an abstract, appro appropriate abstraction principle for these names um, because the objects that they are supposed to stand for are not associated with identity conditions that allow for their proper identification. In other words, they fail to meet CI and the reason why they don't satisfy AP is that they don't satisfy CI. But if this requirement that has to do with identity conditions is not satisfied by fictional names in their external uses, then what about those sentences concerning fictional characters mentioned earlier, such as Raskolnikov is a fictional character, Holmes was created by Doyle, Lolita already appeared in Nabokov's earlier novel, and so on. All of those sentences, I, I was saying, strike as is true, and if they are true, then by SR, the singular terms embedded in them, such as Raskolnikov, Holmes, or Lolita, succeed in referring. But given the latter considerations, this cannot be. If AP or CI are not satisfied, then they, they don't pass the test for reference. Um, so I think this is a dilemma to which we have two ways um, of responding. Option one would be to deny the suitability of the sentences in question. So that would be to maintain SR, but to deny the sentences in question are suitable in the relevant sense. And this is a way represented by Frege. He discusses sentences involving external uses of fictional names in a passage about Odysseus. There he provides an interpretation of the sentence, Odysseus is not a historical person, such that while it comes out as true, it involves a quotational use of the name of the cells. So that allows him to maintain a SAR. And he says that this sentence is true, but is not suitable. So that's why the name uh, is not a referring name. And another option would be to simply say that the sentences in question are both true and suitable, even though did involve terms that do not refer. And of course, maintaining so would be to reject SR, because now we are supposed to say that sentences such as Holmes is a fictional character are true and are suitable, and yet we do not infer from that that the name Holmes is a referring name. And um, this is the way represented by, for example, Tim Crane's recent work. He does not believe in fictional objects, and he argues that fictional names fail to refer. Yet, he believes that the sentences involving them are straightforwardly true. And he develops an account of similarity of representation that allows to say that they are true and suitable without this ontological commitment that SR requires. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Susanna, for your talk. If anyone have questions, oh yes, I see a virtual hand raised by Elliot Zardini. If I'm not mistaken, you were, were first. So wait, wait, wait. Can you just? I have to. How do I can see you again? Oh yeah. 
<laughs> oh yes, yes, I think I can. You should stop sharing your screen. Oh yes. <laughs> yes, yes, stop sharing. Great. Yeah, it's okay. So the first question is from Elia Zardini. Elia, please. Hi. Uh, I have a question about the uh, whether the identity criterion that we find, for example, in Thomason uh, really appeals to the internal perspective rather than the external one. Uh, because I mean, it seems to say something like the, the two fictional characters are identical, if and only if uh, they're attributed the same property in the, in the same um, work of fiction. Yes. Uh, but but that's, that seems an external statement, no? This seems like, a, I'd take, take instances of this statement, like Holmes is attributed uh, the property of being a detective in uh, Conan Doyle's works. This, that strikes me as, a, as an external statement. I mean, it's not, it's not a statement that is true in the fiction created by Conan Doyle because Conan Doyle doesn't exist in the fiction to be created. This is much more uh, an external statement. So, uh, but uh -huh. you, 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 seem to be, you seem to be saying that uh, Thomason has provided a, a kind of internal perspective uh, identity criteria. So I was wondering, yeah, yeah, well, I think, I think that um, perhaps that would be a good way for Thomason to respond. I think, I mean, what I was thinking is very, very simple. Uh, when she says that it depends on the properties they are ascribed in the work, it means that we have to look to inside of the fiction and think whether in the fiction, whether he's tall or short, whether he smokes a pipe and all of that. So those sentences only uh, make sense if we are considering them from within the fiction, from outside of the fiction. Outside of the fiction, there is no Holmes who is either short or tall, or he smokes a pipe or not. So we have to be thinking like how it has been described within the story. So maybe maybe I, I, I haven't read the Thomason paper. Maybe what she says is this vague, uh, oh, we have to look, uh, of whether they share the same properties in the story, but, but maybe there's a way of uh, making that more precise in the, in the way I propose that would push more towards the the external perspective. So it might be might be more promising, given mm. to uh, to address your criticism. Mm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The next question, I see that it was Einstein. Einstein, please. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, very nice uh, uh, talk, Susanna. Um, so I, I like the way you uh, you uh, separate out the SR, CI, and, and AP. And I think my preferred way of looking at it is that these three should work together. Um, and that SR on its own is simply too, too weak. Or is it simply uh, uh, makes it too easy to uh, to uh, to achieve reference. Mm -hmm. So to to really have reference to to an object, it ought to be possible to uh, be presented with that object in in different ways, from different perspectives, so to speak, and recognize this at the same, which pushes you to to CI, and then uh, it should be. Uh, uh, the truth conditions here should be stated in, in neutral terms, not terms that involve the, uh, the object, which pushes you on to, to AP. Uh, so I wonder what you think about that, of, of seeing the three criteria as a package deal rather than uh, separate principles? Um, yeah, so I think that's how, that's how, that's what you should be saying, and mm -hmm. that's how you should be seeing them. Um, but I also think in the literature discussing neo freeganism or abstractionism mm -hmm. more generally, there's a lot of confusion mm -hmm. and about how those principles are supposed to work and yeah. what is the relation? Are they separate or do they go together? Does one entail the other? Mm -hmm. And I think those criticisms that I mentioned at the very beginning that accuse um, abstractionism of, 
of uh, resulting in a true rich ontology site, such as Diverse and Miller has mm -hmm. uh, have those paper about fictional names and Eklund has a paper about even inconsistent objects. Mm -hmm. And both those papers appeal only to SR. So my, my motivation was to, to clarify that SR mm -hmm. is not all, uh, that there are other principles that um, will prevent this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's certainly evidence in, in, in Hale and Wright that they are committed to SR uh, completely on its own. Right. So I think it's very useful to separate out the uh, different principles and, uh, and then perhaps go on to argue that you need all of them and, and not, not SR in isolation. Right. Yeah. I think there is a further question, though, whether, whether we need SR at all. Could mm. we not drop SR and, and simply use CI and AP? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. So CI subject to AP as a, a site constraint on, on, on which criteria of identity you can accept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that seems very reasonable. And, uh, and then uh, just recognize that SR is too strong. It, it makes it too easy to, uh, to yeah. achieve reference. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Susanna. Thanks.